CBS presents this program in color. I really enjoy the history of broadcasting, especially since I was in it and I've been around it so much. It's just been a big part of my life. Chuck Conrad worked in the television news industry beginning in 1967 as a cameraman in Dallas. Over the years, Chuck started acquiring old broadcast equipment that was being thrown away to make room for new technology. Well, that's when you wake up one day and you find out that you are counting and you go, I think I've got about 50 TV cameras sitting here in my garage and I might ought to do something with them, otherwise my wife's going to have one heck of a garage sale. He created the Texas Museum of Broadcasting and Communication in Kilgore. Seldom does a day go by when somebody doesn't bring us something when we're open. Many of the patrons are former newscasters. I've used that camera over, I've used that one, I've used this one. I used to use that, I've edited on something like this. They, they really get into it, actually. I think the general public is more interested in what the hardware has seen. This camera was used by KRLD in Dallas in 1963 when Lee Harvey Oswald was shot live on TV. A lot of these have been donated by TV stations who are going to throw them out anyway. Some cameras were used to broadcast television shows. We've got one camera here that was used on Dick Clark's American Bandstand. Portable field cameras that in the beginning were not that portable. I think one of my favorites is our RCA TK41 color camera, which is serial number 40. It's a very early TV camera, and it's gigantic. It weighs 340 pounds, which is not exactly portable, but they actually did take these things out. Take a few steps up to see one of his favorite pieces on display. I'm sitting in the Dumont Telecruiser. It's a 1949 flexible bus that was built specially to be a TV mobile unit for Channel 8 in Dallas, which at the time was called KBTV. The cruiser cost $96,000 to build. It took five people to operate this. There'd be a director, an audio man, an engineer who's sitting where I am, and two cameramen. With only 14,000 miles on it, the cruiser was no longer needed, and in 1972 sold for auction for $750. It was a lot of work. It took almost 10 years to get it to the state that's in now. It did not look like this at all when we got it. Radio enthusiast Warren Willard also contributed to the vast collection. Well, here we probably have 300 radios. Uh, my collection consists of about 3,000 radios. I enjoy the radio because of its warmth. I enjoy it because of its art form. From one of the earliest phonograph players to a radio that, well, lets you listen on the go, music can be found coming from all mechs and models. This is a 1941 Zenith Radio AM FM console. It's called the Spinet model. It's real unique because it was the first year for FM radio and the last one until 1946. A museum he hopes will educate young people about their past. And most people who come in think they're gonna spend 20 minutes or so and they end up spending an hour and a half, two hours just looking at the stuff. Radio and television, this is where it started and it is part of our legacy to leave to uh, future generations. And when the broadcast day was done, well, you remember TV stations didn't used to stay on all the time. After the 10 o'clock news, you'd see a test pattern. And this is the gadget that made that Indian head test pattern. For CBS 19, I'm not J.B. Smith, but that's his story.